What's going on, YouTube? This is Athletic Alert, sponsored by Michael Rosenblum, podiatrist, your foot and ankle specialist. I'm your host, Colin, and today we will be talking about some fantasy baseball. The 2018 MLB season is right around the corner. In fact, spring training games just got started a couple of days ago, which means your fantasy draft is coming up quick. And uh, I'm here to make your job just a little bit easier. So today we're going to be talking about a bunch of value picks. I don't want to necessarily call them sleepers because some of them have, have you've known their name for years. However, I'm going to be going through one person per position that I think is at a great value in drafts right now. And it's somebody you should really take low risk, high reward for these players. So we're just going to start. We're just going to hop right into it. Obviously, we have a little bit more of a podcast style, which we don't really do uh, that often. So we're actually going to be, I'm just going to be talking almost like a radio broadcast, and I'll do pictures in front of uh, my voice. But uh, no video today, but the information is certainly still going to get there. So let's talk about catchers first. My first catcher, a young, young prospect who finally got a taste of the big leagues last year, and his name from the Philadelphia Phillies is Jorge Alfaro. Now, Alfaro came over originally in that Cole Hamels deal uh, from Texas and uh, now sitting pretty with the Phillies. In 29 games last year, he had five home runs, 14 RBIs, and a 318 average. That 318 average certainly pops off the board, and all of his underlying stats suggest that that's going to be coming way back. He was just a lucky hitter. And uh, you know what? I, I totally agree with that. I, th I think he's more of a 260 hitter if he's lucky. Um, now, the reason he's not going uh, so high, actually, he's being undrafted right now. I mean, this is a guy you could pick up off waivers or he's be being taken in the last round of your draft. And that's because Cameron Rupp, people think he's going to be a big issue. Listen, Cameron Rupp, as good as he is, he didn't put enough together last year to really make a case to stay with the team this year he was barely batting over 200 for a long portion of the season and that's just something a rebuilding team can't have um, I see Alfaro easily winning the job in spring training this year which means you can take advantage of people being concerned that he's not going to get the job um, and let's just say for all intents and purposes let's say they keep both Cameron Rupp and Alfaro on the roster and they split time. Even if Alfaro gets a little bit of the majority and only plays 100 games, if you project his stats out for 100 games from last season, he's still hitting you over 15 home runs and close to 50 RBIs, which from the catcher position we all know is very, very valuable. I compare him to a poor man's Evan Gaddis. Evan Gaddis only played 85 games last year. He had 12 home runs and 55 RBIs and hit 260. So you're basically getting an Evan Gaddis type season from last year with Alfaro this year. And I think that's his floor. I mean, if the guy gets a bigger job, who knows what he could put up. So that's that's why he, he really is a value because I would definitely take him, no doubt about it, in a two-catcher league, in a dynasty league because his value is, is going to rise per year. But if you're only in a one-catcher league, not a bad way to spend your last pick because if he breaks out, you know half your league is going to be looking for catchers. And that's some perfect trade bait right there. Uh, so let's jump into first base. Let's move around the diamond. And let's talk about Miguel Cabrera. We jump from a young guy to an old guy. And everything surrounding Cabrera has to do with injury, right? The, hurt, the, hurt, uh, the hurting discs in his lower back really affected his play last year. You could see it. He only hit 16 home runs, 60 RBIs with a 249 average. That's what stands out to you because Miguel is somebody who you would think had an off year if he hit 305 and he hit 249. I think, listen, this guy is a proven player. He's somebody who won the Triple Crown back in, I believe, 2012. I mean, I understand that's a long time ago, but for everybody saying Father Time is starting to bite him, just look back two years ago. In 2016, he hit 38 home runs over 100 RBIs and hit 316. Insane numbers. And you're going to tell me that this guy right now is going in the 11th round at pick 126 in a standard 12-team league? That's insane. Because even if he improves his numbers from last year only by about halfway to 2016 numbers, 
You're looking at a guy who's going to hit over 20 home runs, get close to 75, 80 RBIs, and hit 275 or 280. And for me, I think that's the floor for Miguel Cabrera. That's what you're going to get out of him this year because he's more motivated, and frankly, he's had a whole offseason to heal. So he's somebody I wouldn't sleep on. I understand, you know, everybody saying, oh, Detroit has a terrible lineup, and, you know, they, they lost everyone. Yes, when you lose Ian Kinsler, you lose Justin Upton, you lose all these big-name guys, sure, yeah, the lineup looks looks a little bit more bleak. However, they still have some pretty good prospects in their system. If they put guys at the front of the order that can get on base and be a little bit quicker, because obviously Miguel can't run, Miguel just needs people on base. He'll drive them in. I, I have no worry with the lineup. I think Miguel Cabrera is a player that is lineup proof, and he could hit no matter where he was. And if you want a comparison, somebody who's going, I, again, I said Miguel in the 11th round. How about Will Myers? Will Myers is going in the 6th round. Last year he hit 30 bombs, 74 RBIs, and had a 243 average. 243. What's the difference between him and Miguel Cabrera? I understand the only thing you could say about Will Myers, he stole 20 bases. Okay, big whoop. You know, I mean, stolen bases, you can get at other positions, but Will Myers is going to kill you in average, and Miguel Cabrera is not. Uh, second baseman, uh, let's, let's talk about another old guy in Ian Kinsler, a former teammate of Miguel Cabrera's. He moves to the Angels, and this is just a simple move for me. I mean... You're looking at a guy who, in 2017, hit 236, but still scored 90 runs and 20-plus homers. And, oh, by the way, he stole more than 10 bags. That's valuable in and of itself. I don't know why his batting average dropped out of nowhere. A lot of people blaming that on how old he was. I think he was just kind of unlucky. I think there was a lot of stuff going on in Detroit last year. For some reason, that whole, that whole team just really had a down year. And now he moves to the Los Angeles Angels, where he's going to be hitting in front of Mike Trout, Albert Pujols, and Justin Upton. Those are those are arguably the the best trio in baseball, and he's going to be hitting in the in the leadoff spot. Now he's used to hitting the leadoff spot in Detroit, so that's not an issue for him. I think Ian Kinsler is somebody who can easily push for a hundred plus runs scored. And still get you those 20 home runs and those 10-plus stolen bases because somebody's got to steal uh, bases down in Anaheim. So uh, I really think that uh, Ian Kinsler, even though for how old he is, he's an oldie, but he's a goodie. And everybody's taking a guy like Chris Taylor before him, a couple rounds before him. Right now, Ian Kinsler is going in the 14th round. Chris Taylor probably somewhere in the 11th round. Chris Taylor had one great year. I mean, Ian Kinsler, you have an entire track record. I don't understand why you wouldn't take Kinsler over a guy like Taylor. Shortstop, I had to mention his name. He's not necessarily a naturally born shortstop, but this guy is so valuable in drafts, he has to be brought up, and that is Marwin Gonzalez of the Houston Astros. Guys, listen, there is nobody left in ESPN fantasy or any fantasy league for that matter that can play multiple positions. They made it a lot harder for people to earn eligibility at multiple positions. Marwin Gonzalez is the last hope at our super utility player. He plays shortstop, he plays first base, he plays second base, and he plays outfield. Those are the four positions he's eligible for this year. So what makes him so good, right now he's being drafted in the 12th round, 138th. That's decent value, but personally, I would reach up to grab him. I would reach up almost as close to pick 100 as I could to get him. Why? Well, look, last year he hit over 300, hit 20 home runs, 90 RBIs, 8 stolen bases. Personally, I'm going to cut straight to the chase. I think all those numbers go down across the board. I think he hits around 270, 280. I think he might barely get 20 home runs. You're looking at more like 70 RBIs and maybe five stolen bases. But that's still that's still pretty, not elite, but still pretty good uh, stats across the board. And what Marwin provides you is safety. This is the old Ben Zobrist of the draft, especially if you're new to drafting fantasy baseball. A guy like Marwin Gonzalez could help out so many teams no matter how you decide to draft. 
because he's valuable at, and he's eligible at all those positions. So if you wait on shortstop, okay, but I have Marwin Gonzalez. You wait on first base, okay, well, you know, I didn't get somebody great, but, oh, I have Marwin Gonzalez. If you mess up at a position, he can pretty much play everywhere. And that's why I had to bring his name up because I think he, he is uber important uh, in that aspect. Now let's move to third base, and it's going to be Jake Lamb of the Arizona Diamondbacks. Jake Lamb is going in the 11th round. 121 ADP is his average pick. And I just think he's a top 10 third baseman. All top, all top 10 ranked third basemen in ESPN right now are going within the first 100 picks. I believe Jake Lamb is around 13 or 14. This guy is easily in the top 10 for third baseman. Last year, he had 30 home runs, 105 RBIs, and six stolen bases. And the big, the big storyline surrounding Jake Lamb is he always has a great first half, terrible second half. And last year, two years ago, it was attributed to hand issues. This year, you know, you could just attribute it to how he is as a player. However, what you can't deny is that he's going to play a lot of games in Coors Field because they're, the Rockies are in their division. His home field is <laughs> at Arizona. We all know Chase Field is a hitter-friendly park, so I, I don't see any path uh, for him not to repeat 25-plus homers and approaching close to 100 RBIs. He gets to hit behind the best hitter in the game in Paul Goldschmidt, and he's only 27. I think now in baseball we see, yeah, the rookies are having a huge impact, but a lot of people are popping up out of nowhere having these career years in their late 20s, early 30s. That's kind of normal for baseball. So it wouldn't surprise me if Jake Lamb broke out and had an unbelievable season. I would just reach up to grab him. Um, and, uh, you know, that's pretty much it. I mean, the third base, the, the third baseman class, you have all these elite guys, the Arenados, you have the Chris Bryants. And then you have guys who haven't signed yet but are pretty elite, Mike Moustakis, you know, and, and, and that, that bunch. But right below that is the Jake Lamb tier, which I think could easily surpass. Like, I could see Jake Lamb finishing with more points or more value in a rotisserie than, uh, than Moose, especially if he can't find a team. He won't have a job. No, he'll find somewhere. But I like Jake Lamb a lot. I think he's in a very good situation. Finally, outfield, it's going to be Lewis Brinson. Lewis Brinson, remember the name, Miami Marlins. And <laughs> the reason I say remember the name is this is going to be my hottest take. I think this is me going out on the boldest limb and telling you to draft him. I don't really have a track record because he's a rookie, and I, I really don't have anything to go off of except for the fact that the dude is built. The man is built like a tank, and everyone surrounding the baseball community has said that he is a perfect 2020 threat. 20 home runs, 20 stolen bases. That is beautiful, especially for any rotisserie league, but great for a points league as well. Everybody says his average is going to suffer. They, they think he's going to hit somewhere in the 230s, 240s. Listen, I don't see that happening. I see him hitting at least 260. Um, I mean, this guy hit 331 in AAA last year. I think he's ready for big league pitching. He had a tough little taste of the majors with Milwaukee last year, but now he lands in Miami. He gets traded in that huge uh, deal for Christian Yelich, and Miami, we know, is going to be battling for the worst record in the league this year, so you know he's going to have a long leash. And because of his power and speed threat, it wouldn't surprise me if they stuffed him in the middle of the order, which if they stuff him in the middle of the, uh, of the order in Miami— you're looking at him at least getting 500 plate appearances, which for a rookie is very rare to come by, and that's a great situation to land because he can start to learn the pitches, and we're going to be able to get a full display of what Brinson can handle. He's going undrafted right now, and that's why I think he's a value pick because you can get him in your last round or second to last round and just store him. Listen, we know guys break out in the middle of fantasy baseball seasons, and we have to watch the waiver wire and do whatever. But why wait for Brinson to break out or Jorge Alfaro? Why wait for these rookies to break out when you could draft them, see how they do the first couple weeks in the season, and if they broke out, you already own them. It's not like you missed out on him in the waiver wire. If somebody else breaks out and Brinson's not doing well, okay, so you drop Brinson and pick up the other guy. But I think Brinson and Alfaro especially, are two rookies with probably the most talent and opportunity this year. 
So I would definitely pounce on those two players, especially at the end of your draft. I know outfield, you got to draft multiple outfielders. I only did one for this episode. If you want a couple more names, I like Carlos Gomez recently signing with the Tampa Bay Rays. I think he might be able to um, reinvigorate his career. And I also like Willie Calhoun as a rookie with Texas. I think he's a small, built guy who could really hit some homers, and he he won't kill you in the average department because uh, he's known for making very good contact. Um, But other than that, um, you know, outfield is a position that most guys you're going to get in the early rounds. So I could see, you know, Brinson, I would say, can no, be no later, no, I mean, no earlier than your, uh, your fourth outfielder. You have to have a starting three. I would not hold Brinson to be able to hold a starting role on your team. I, I just think he's an excellent bench guy. Um, but yeah, so that's going to do it. Uh, if you have any questions, fantasy questions, please leave them in the comments section below. As always, please subscribe to the channel, especially if you want to see more content. Spread our channel around. Um, Leave a like on this video. Uh, And, you know, if you want any other kind of content, let me know. Uh, Whether that be busts, uh, whether that be who's the best person at each position, whatever you want to know fantasy-wise, we are here to answer. Um, So just let us know. But hopefully this helps you out this fantasy baseball season. Um, And you know, follow us for more tips and tricks. Thank you all for tuning in and we will catch you all next time.